Gaijin Entertainment presents The Shooting Range In this episode, some bigger boats, the MZ-1 and the Project 122 BIS, a flying shuttle bus called the Lockheed Hudson, be afraid, be very afraid. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments, but first, let's start with the overview of a new naval mission. During the recent weekend, Captains of War Thunder had a chance to test a new location and a new mission type for naval battles called Convoy. The objective is to destroy transport ships that are a part of an enemy convoy. Hardly a surprise, right? Whilst protecting your own, the fleet of ships is a hard nut to crack, given that the transports are escorted by an armada of vicious gunboats. A single hit from most of their guns is enough to wreck your engine room, making you an easy target for enemy players. You can prevail only through joint efforts of several players piloting craft of different types and classes, both naval and aerial. And don't get too optimistic about your chances of survival. During the test, even the most well-coordinated teams could only get rid of roughly one-third of the enemy convoy in a single pass. Do not fear death, though. At the mission's start, all players pilot light boats, the Soviet Project 1A3 or the German S-100. But if you're actively helping your team by damaging or destroying enemy vessels, you get spawn points. Yeah, those SP that you're all familiar with. These can be later used to enter the fray on attack aircraft or heavier ships. We'll discuss them later. It doesn't pay to be careless, though. Light boats do not require SP to respawn, but every time you're sunk, your team loses a fighter for at least a few seconds. And that might and will be a deciding factor in many battles. Try to make the most out of every vessel. Usually, there really isn't any rush to get into enemy sights after respawn. Find yourself a comfy spot behind a rock, wait for an enemy to come, then group up and show the other team who's boss. You better attack the head or tail of the convoy. This way, you won't get as much return fire. Another good idea is to attack in an extended order. This way, you'll maximize the chances that someone will make it to the targets. Leave torpedoes and other nasty little surprises for the transports. Try to sink the enemy gunboats using your regular armaments. And the last thing. The sea is pretty choppy here. Don't forget to account for swell while aiming. Okay, we've destroyed some vessels. Let's spend those hard-earned SP points on the bigger boats and see what they can do. Just look at these two, the German MZ-1 and the Soviet Project 122 BIS. These vessels have far superior firepower over all torpedo boats that we've seen earlier. They're also considerably heavier. At the same time, these two ships are very different in the way they're played. The Soviet Kronstadt-class submarine chaser certainly doesn't lack in the firepower department. It has an 85mm gun, a couple of 37mm cannons and three machine gun turrets more than enough to cripple enemy vessels. But that's not the Project 122 BIS's main selling point. It has almost 60 crew members. That's almost four times than on a typical torpedo boat. Yeah, the vessel is relatively slow and doesn't deal a lot of damage per second, but it can survive almost anything. We've managed to keep on fighting in that thing after being hit with a torpedo. There was a huge hole in our hull, the water was pouring in, but after we've lost a few compartments to the sea, the ship stabilized and trudged onwards. What's interesting is that it even made it easier to aim, as the waves weren't able to rock the ship as much as they did before. Another curious fact, the Project 122 BIS carries not one, not five, but 22 D-bombs. Around a dozen of those are released into the sea in a regular fashion and a couple can be thrown to your left or to your right, and the rest are projector depth charges that are fired ahead of the vessel with the help of a special forward-throwing weapon. Yeah, it's just like a mortar, basically. It is certainly a tricky thing to shoot with, and the results are often dubious, but man, it is fun! 
Remember that this ship should always lead the attack. It can sustain a lot of damage and hold its own against any kind of threat, while also giving your light boats a chance to sink some transports. The German ship is a completely different story. It doesn't have the same survivability or protection and compared to its Soviet counterparts has almost no crew members. But it hits like a ton of bricks every single second. Torpedoes, D-bombs, an impressive array of guns of different calibers, your enemy should be thankful that the sea is so rough. In a calm sea, this monster would tear through any target in mere seconds. It requires the player to be very careful, though. The MC-1 works best when you're fighting on your own terms. Set up an ambush, get your enemy unawares, and then count the trophies. Okay, not only we've seen some ships, it is only fitting that we discuss one of their nemesis, a fearsome civil passenger aircraft called the Lockheed Super Electra. What? Paul Hibbert and his young assistant that went by the name of Clarence Kelly Johnson didn't plan to make a bomber. Far from it, their intent was unwarlike as possible. They just wanted to design a good civil passenger and cargo aircraft, a reliable and nimble machine that could carry loads of cargo and operate from any kind of unprepared airfield. That's basically what they did. The graceful and versatile Lockheed Model 10 Electra immediately became very popular among pilots. That's hardly surprising given that this aircraft allowed for some unbelievable shenanigans. Pilots used the Electra to take off mountains and glaciers, to land on swamps and patches of land in the middle of a jungle. They did full loops and sent the aircraft into a controlled spin, sometimes with passenger on board. What a way to have some harmless fun, huh? And that was just the original Model 10 Electra. The aircraft was later developed into more roomy and more powerful models number 12 and 14. The silver wings of the Electra brought civilization to the most remote corners of the world. At the same time, the very same civilization was at the verge of going down the drain of a new great war in Europe. In 1938, the British Purchasing Commission came to the US in search of a reliable aircraft that could be used to ward off the Nazi menace. In a quirk of fate, the head of the British Commission ran into a Lockheed Electra and couldn't help but exclaim, what's a fine bomber? Johnson was surprised, but he decided to go for it anyway. Without missing a beat, he said, it's not just a bomber, it's also an anti-submarine aircraft, an attack bomber, and it can carry troops. In front of the stunned audience, the engineer promised to show a prototype model in a few days. Let's put it this way, it ain't easy to remake a civilian plane for military purposes. To make matters even more interesting, the project had to be completed in record-breaking time. After just a few days, Lockheed engineers presented the fruit of their labors. It was no lecture this time. That was a true machine of war that could carry up to 1,600 pounds of bombs. Two Browning machine guns in its nose were ready to send a fiery greeting to any enemy in the front. And two more machine guns in a dorsal turret were promising a lifelong supply of fun to any pursuer. But that wasn't even the main thing. Extra sturdy gear legs and expertly designed Fowler flaps allowed the militarized Electra to take off from almost any surface, even with a full bomb load. And there was still room for some passengers, which means that the new aircraft could be used to transport cargo, also for aeromedical evacuation or for infiltration purposes. The Commission asked only for a few small changes in design, and this new light bomber became the first significant aircraft construction contract for the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. Just like that, the Electra was ready for war. Thanks to the Royal Air Force, we found out the Electra's surname was Hudson. As early as on October 8, 1939, Miss Electra Hudson got its first elimination by shooting down the German DO-18 flying boat. Just for your information, that was the first time the Allied aircraft operating from the British Isles shot down an enemy plane. Not badass enough? A Hudson forced a German submarine to surrender. Another Hudson became the first US aircraft to destroy a German submarine. The bomber was so good that practically everyone wanted to have it. France, the Netherlands, Australia, Brazil, you name it. Only much later, when the Hudson was hopelessly outclassed by larger bombers, did it return to its original domain, the civil airways. 
and that's where it allowed pilots to have harmless fun for many more years, with all sorts of, you'd be sorry you've eaten before you take off airlines. Finally, it's time for the traditionalized part of our show, Hotline. Developers answer questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official forums. Here we'll have a more lighthearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. We we'll hope you like it. The first question comes from a player called Swoo. Is the Japanese faction going to get a heavy tank? Yes! A one premium heavy tank for our katana-wielding friends is already in the works, and we will try to add a vehicle of this class to the regular tree as well. But it's a bit tricky, as we can only implement the tanks that were actually built. Miguel da Silva asks, How many Japanese tanks are coming in the future? Many? Few? Or what? Quite a few, actually. We want Japan to be a full-fledged game nation. Then there's a question from the Professional Drift. Can you give us any update on the PSVR support? We're working on it, mate. Can't give any details, though. Our agreement with Sony is a little bit restricting. Then there's a question from a player called Flicking Gamer. Is anything ever going to be done about those OP trees and mountains? I've lost almost as many ground attack planes to those as I have to enemy action. Yeah, their current BR might be a little bit too high. We're still not sure what we want to do about this problem, but we're certainly going to nerf the pines. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range!